Okay, I'd like to welcome back on stage Amir Karangi. He's going to be the moderator for our next panel on hospitality. Amir, let's do this. As uh, you guys know that uh, hospitality is extremely important for South Florida. It's 40% of your tax bases and it's the largest job creator in Florida. So we're very happy to have Dave Grutman of Groot Hospitality, who's here today, one of the biggest nightlife guys in the country right now and definitely the biggest guy here in South Florida. And probably the only person we've ever had while doing this for 18 years who was on the cover of a GQ magazine. So that, that, that was, uh, I wanted to get that in there. And of course, Jeff Sofer, the CEO and chairman of Fountain Blue Development, who's the largest hotel owner in South Florida. And Jeff, uh, Jeff is actually a guy who should be on the cover of uh, GQ, but guys, come on up here. Let's, let's give him a big round of applause. Come on, this, let's get it going. Thank you, guys. Thank you, this is great. Thank you guys both for being here. I know you guys have done uh, work together. I know you guys both had challenges when the pandemic first started. And obviously, hospitality was an area that was um, going to get affected. And I know you guys were both very concerned. David, I know you actually had some of your uh, best times in the last two years. But Jeff, for you, I know the Fountain Blue, one of the largest hotels in South, it is the largest hotel in South Florida, and you guys do a lot of conferences. How did the pandemic change your strategy, and how did you go about it when it first happened? Well, obviously, you know, the pandemic, when everything got shut down, everybody was shut down. I mean, it was, I think, what, mid-March? If you could just uh, hold on. I'm sorry, mid-March, everything started to shut down. Obviously, you know, owning hotels and employing thousands of people, you know, no one really runs a business with no revenue, right? It's never been heard of. So really just looked at everything, and obviously we had to make layoffs and just get prepared. We didn't know how long it was going to last. Um, we opened at the end of May. We shut down in, at the middle of March, and obviously during March, you know, the first four months of the year are big months in South Florida from a hospitality perspective because rates are high. A lot of people are coming here. They want to, you know, the weather's you know, really great. So it, it, it just, we sort of just went through it. I mean, you know, and had to do what we had to do. And then once things opened up, it got better, you know, right away, like in, in May, it was, I'm sorry, in, in uh, June, it was better. And then this second wave started happening. They started clamping down on the beaches and shut, they wanted it. It was just a, it was an unknown area. So but ultimately, you know, through the end of the last year, it started to, you know, the governor did a great job in the state, keeping things open, getting, getting things going, and we ultimately got going at the end of last year, and then, you know, the first quarter this year was a little weaker than it normally was, but then after that, it's been just record-setting months. Was there any moment of panic? Well, I mean, Sure, you don't know when you're, you know, run a business and, you know, they just tell you you can't open it, you have to shut it down. You, I mean, you still got to pay all of our overhead, our insurances, our real estate taxes, employees, you know, that we were there. So it was, you know, but I obviously just wrote checks and just, you just hope, hope for the best. That's all you can do. And David, for you, I know you, you had just sold 51% of your company at a crazy valuation. Was that before the pandemic or... So I was lucky enough to sell 51% in October, March, COVID hits. So the timing was, was pretty good. <laughs> All right. But, you know, thinking about what you just asked, and Jeff, I don't know if you remember. Uh, I remember when COVID was first starting to, to be in the press, and Jeff would call me every day and be like, David, I, I, I don't know what's going on with this. And then he's like, we got to shut down live. And I'm like, shut down live? It's about to be ultra. You're crazy, man. It's, it's nothing. He's like, no. I mean, every day he would call me and be like, listen, we have to be, we have to set the trend. We have to be the first ones to do it. And then the NBA says, that's it. We're taking a pause. And that kind of made it up for us. And Jeff goes, go ahead and let's shut down Live and Story. And let's really set the standard for everybody else. And as soon as we did that, everyone else did set the standard. And they all did take a pause. But I remember the, the torture you put me through. 
and, and us going, no, just one more week, one more day, one more anything, right? And uh, to his credit, he was ahead of the curve and was like, listen, man, we really care about our guests, and we're going to shut it down. David, you give a lot of credit to Jeff for launching your career. And that's a, that's a big, pretty big thing. And you guys are both here on stage right now. Jeff, what made you want to invest in David? What, what gave you faith in David? Oh, God. <laughs> um, well, you really want to hear the story? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Does everyone want to hear the real story about Dave Grubman? Because um, now that he's a you know, major celebrity, he can't walk around in the public out here without getting harassed. No, he's a great guy. Uh, basically, I had met David. He actually, when he got out of high school, ironically, you know, my father had a restaurant at Aventura Mall. When one tenant went out and he had this idea he wanted to open a restaurant and open this restaurant. And David actually worked there. But I don't even remember you when you were there. I was a bartender, Jeff. Okay, okay. At so the, At the Biz um, Bistro at the Aventura Mall. Okay, so that, that happened. Then after that, when I was opening a Fountain Blue, doing the Fountain Blue here in Miami Beach, um, we were talking with another co company that was out in Las Vegas called uh, Pure Hospital. You know, they had, they had a big nightclub out there. The, it didn't work out. I had met David through that year with one of my guys that worked with me. And then when it didn't work out with Pure, I'm like, I remember meeting David. He was doing uh, like uh, pop-ups for like direct TV. He doesn't want to say this, but this is the truth. He was doing a, like, uh, you know, they would launch a new show and David would do a promotion. You know, he had a partner. So I said, I told my guy, Brian O'Shields, I'm like, Brian, get a hold of Dave Grubman. I want to put him in charge and put him in this live. And that's the truth. And, you know, he, he came in. We got the hotel open. And I guess the rest so is history. I'm, so I'm sorry. You're saying you actually discovered David, and it wasn't David who came to you to pitch you on any? Uh, no. I mean, here no, we go. It wasn't Dude, at all. You can't it, say stuff like it, Jeff Sofer discovered me because he won't stop. I, 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 <laughs> but, that, guys, just really so you know, uh, just so you know my, my, first, my firstborn daughter's middle name is Sof because I call Jeff Sof Sof. He threatened me that so he would. That's, that's he, how much I owe my career and my life to giving me the platform to really be able to soar. So if there's one thing ever you have to know about me, uh, Jeff has tried to make it, dumbed it down. He's done so much for, to give me a, a platform to really soar. It's, it's incredible. I'll never forget it. I won't ever forget it because of my daughter's name. <laughs> yeah, and he also threatened me if I wasn't nice to him in this conference, he was going to change her name. That's so. a fact. <laughs> I said, listen, I will change her name. <laughs> Anyways, but no, David did a great job. I mean, we obviously, the Fountain Blue took off, and he's, you know, today, we still kill it. You know, I mean, he does, nobody does better than Dave Grubman, so he has his eye on every pulse of every trend of every entertainer, musician, actor, whatever it takes to activate his business, and obviously, Fountain Blue and Story are, are parts of his business and, and mine as well, so, and we're obviously excited about bringing him to Las Vegas with us, so. He's uh, well, tell us about Las Vegas. Oh, What's oh going there's there? a little, there's a little tidbit for you right there. I, huh? I don't know. Is, has that been out there? Jeff but, uh, just dropped a big Jeff, bomb Jeff, on Jeff, what guys. is going on in Las Vegas? What are you guys? Are you doing a Fountain Blue in Las Vegas? And yeah. Dave's going to come along, or? Yeah, well, I, where, where I'm going to hold his I always, I always somehow I can't get rid of him, you know. But uh, <laughs> no, nah, we are, uh, we're actually we announced yesterday. I'm sure I don't know if people saw or whatever, but we are. I bought back the original development that I was building in Las Vegas, which was unfinished, that sat there for like 12 years. And it's a 4,000 room hotel, 9 million square feet of space. And it's gonna be a Fountain Blue Las Vegas. It's gonna open at the end of 2023. So we're very excited about that. And, and I think that, you know, uh, uh, I think that it's, it's, it's also important for South Florida because having two big resorts and two key markets in the, in the United States brings a lot of different people and it just ups the game and I think that the cross marketing between Miami and Las Vegas or in Las Vegas and Miami is very unique and nobody has that and I think that it will help South Florida and bring more people here more different people and new faces and people that want to spend money and buy real estate and you know spend a lot of money spend a lot of money in David's restaurants yeah I know that uh, there is a uh, it, Fountain Blue has become such a brand, you know, it's, uh, it's become an integral part of Miami and South Florida. Is there, a, outside of Las Vegas, are there plans to actually expand the brand into other uh, key markets? 
Well, I've been asked, obviously, over the years, and I never really did it because I didn't want to really, you know, I own the Fountain Blue, and I own, it's not like Marriott or Hilton where they own these brands, but people own the hotels. So for me, it's, it's about, you know, wh what the product is, what we're delivering in the experience. And uh, I just never did it, and it had to be the right thing. And, you know, obviously, probably eventually, but right now it's just 100% Las Vegas, 100% Miami, and staying focused on that. These are big properties that have a lot of different components to them that, you know, we're doing new stuff all the time with them. David, you have a lot of interesting concepts. Obviously, the nightlife stuff, for sure, but the restaurants, the different concepts, I mean, and they're, even though they're, you know, sushi and fried chicken and stuff like that, they're some, in some ways, they're exotic concepts that you do. <laughs> but, he, make, he makes this shit up at his bedroom, I promise but, you. But that, he doesn't have a clue what it means. He just comes up with these names. But that, that's what I, I mean, wanted to do. The diner, Winkers, the cat. I mean, he's very good I at that. I have a one-eyed cat, Winkers. So I, we named the diner. No, after. no, but I, that, this is what I wanted to ask you. How much of the stuff that you come up with is intuition? And how, of it, how much of it is like data where you're like, hey, sushi and fried chicken go together? You know, well, like, there's no data, that's for sure. Let's, let's start there. I, so, I'm gonna, I want to answer this question <laughs> because I really do. This is, and I won't interrupt enough to. Sushi and fried chicken, it's more like just shock and awe, because really sushi and fried chicken do not go together. But he wants the shock experience with the fried chicken, but it's really about the sushi, because the place happens to be killing it. I mean, yeah. he, and he'll tell you that, but that's, that's, that's what he likes to do. And then, you know, Jeff is obsessed with poppy steak. So it's crazy to see this guy. He's obsessed with poppy, my partner at poppy steak, and he loves all the shtick. And I think in today's world, with everybody coming down, that could be your night out is going to Komodo or Poppy Steak or Swan. It's not always going to have to be the big crazy nightclubs. Of course, we love Live and Story and, and the nightclub experience. But, you know, I think as people get out and they, they try new things, people love the whole dinner party program. And I think it's as we get older, too, I kind of think it's, it's our thing, too, is we want to be able to you want to be able to have an elevated experience even at dinner. Or lunch. So, I mean, that's what we try to give you with our stuff. No, I, I got to give you credit, Dave. Every, at, I have eaten at several of your restaurants, most recently at Sushi Fly Chicken. And I got to tell you, the, the food is always uh, really good. I, I do have to give you credit for that. And I wanted to ask you, when you come up with these concepts, do you have some executive chef that sort of uh, comes up with these menus for all of the restaurants? Or you have specific guys for every single place you have so we do have a corporate chef that oversees the chefs but each restaurant has its own dna has its own makeup and uh the chef uh, that's but we put all our chefs together to create menus right and i think that's why we're successful is we we try to get a little bit from everybody in the company as we create new concepts and new and new menus so jeff obviously a guy with your means you get a lot of people who come and try to pitch you for different projects and different ideas. What are some of the stuff that you're looking for when people come to you with ideas for projects and stuff? I mean, obviously, I mean, in the real estate, I mean, residential condos and stuff like that. I don't, I mean, I used to do a lot more of it. Um, it, it it's really site driven in location. And then of course, what kind of product we're gonna develop, build there. That, I don't get a lot of the pitches on that side, but we do get from time to time different concepts pitched to us at the Fountain Blue, you know, whether they work with a the property they don't or events. But, you know, look, most of my stuff, I mean, obviously from a restaurant stuff, we've done our, you know, the stuff we have there. But, you know, David's got some great concepts that we're doing in Las Vegas, which we'll announce in the next, you know, over the next year. Um, you know, and it's, it's, it's sort of, I've always been a guy sort of to, to build something that's, you know, sort of stands out and, and not try to cheap out on what I'm building and try to do it 100%. And I think that's but, important. But just in general, I have a lot of my students from Columbia here, and I just want them to hear from you. In general, what do you look for for people that you choose to partner with? I mean, obviously, we choose to partner with good people. I mean, I think work is, is only, there's only one way to work. It's just to work hard and be straight with people and, you know, obviously, well capitalized. You know, it's, it's I mean, to work hard, you know, on, on these projects, it takes, you know, it's really what, what you're developing, what you're building. You know, I don't really take projects that I'm pitching, you know, from other people and say I'm taking it. So, you know, I've been around Jeff for many years and watching people pitch to Jeff 
and seeing what Jeff looks for and goes for. He's a real long ball player. So Jeff is not one of these guys, and sorry, but he doesn't like, like the pop-up guys. He really wants a long, a long ball player. And he always goes with like classic, cutting edge chefs and concepts that he knows is gonna last the test of time. He doesn't wanna have to change concepts every couple of years. And the one thing I've learned from Jeff more than anyone is when I go to design and build a space is to always get the best in class. The best designers use the best quality stuff, finishes. If you build the best mousetrap, it's half the battle. And that's one of the things that I've definitely I've gotten from you over the years. Dave, now that you're holding the mic, I'm really curious, who manages your social media? Because so it's a I constant do, I, stream. I, I uh, do it myself. I do it myself. How do you manage to do that and everything else? I've, I mean, if you asked my wife, it might be the most annoying thing ever, but I'm really into it. And I think what's great about it is it's authentic. It's me. It's not somebody in some office doing my social media for me. You know what you're going to get, the good, the bad, the whole thing. It's me. And I think that's why it resonates a little bit. And obviously, I, this is a question that somebody actually had sent us. They wanted to know if uh, after you partnered up with Live Nation, did that give you more access to the talent that you have coming to you? So as soon as I partnered with them, COVID happened. So it hasn't yet, but it's the number one entertainment company in the world, and I'm in the fun business. So, you know, I'm sure it's going to be great. And how do you, you know, when something launches like a hotel or a nightclub, there's always that initial buzz. But how do you keep the buzz going, you know, week after week, month after month? So people ask me all the time, they're like, you know, of course, on a grand opening, of course it's great, and there's hype and buzz, and how do you keep it consistently hot and, and exciting? Couple things. First thing is I really focus on the content and it's a constant, 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 constant situation. I'm a huge believer in PR and marketing, obviously. And at the end of the day, we're, we're marketeers. We're, it's, the hospitality business is not just food and beverage, it's also being a marketeer. And I think by constantly putting these people and PRing and marketing and keeping it fresh, that's the longevity of a place. And also in a city like Miami, a lot of people from out of town don't take care of the locals. And I've learned over the years, when someone from out of town comes to Miami, the first thing they do is they call their friend that happens to be a local in Miami. So that's one thing we really focus on is the locals and not just the out of town dollar. I saw this uh, interview with you that um, you said that sometimes when you go by other restaurants that you don't own, you'll see a friend in that restaurant and you take it really personal. And you say, why, I have eight restaurants in this city, why aren't you eating at one of those in every... So, so unfortunately, Poppy Steak happens to be next to Milo's. And as all you know, Milo's is a very popular, delicious restaurant. And as soon as I walk over to Poppy Steak, I look in that window, and if I see a friend of mine, I'm like, this. I, I don't understand, it's right next door. You could have easily gone to my place. But I think that, that one core value of mine about taking it personal, it's been a real big key to my success. I take it personal, why is that guest eating at another restaurant or buying a bottle at another club? And if I feel that way and I make sure my team feels that way, it's, it's the key. Are, are you shy about asking, you have a lot of celebrity friends, are you shy about asking them to come to your- David uh, is not shy about anything. <laughs> shy, I beg, I do, do a car show, whatever it takes. Whatever it fucking takes. Just so you know. <laughs> Uh, Jeff, you're talking about buying one of the largest, uh, doing one of the largest hotel deals in uh, Florida. I think it was an $800 million deal in Hollandale. What's going on with that project? Yeah, I, 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 we, we're, we're, I don't want to comment on that right now. <laughs> sounds, sounds interesting. Um, there's, uh, and then casinos, obviously casino, being able to have casinos here uh, would be a boom for your business. What, are, you, are you pushing for that? Are you lobbying for that? You just had... A lot of politicians here. Well, obviously, c casinos, when you talk casinos, it comes controversy. I, I do own a, a casino up in Broward County. There's eight of them in Dade and Broward County at various uh, paramutual facilities. And, of course, then you have the Seminole Hard Rock. I mean, we're obviously, we, sp we spend a lot of time lobbying. The industry does. I mean, the Seminoles have a pretty strong foothold in Florida. And we each have our permits, and they allow us to play certain games. And, of course, we're always keeping a pulse on what's going on here. Dave, is that something you would be interested in? I mean, you're doing restaurants. No, I hate clubs. casino coming to the Fountain Blue. That'd be terrible, terrible for Lyft, terrible. <laughs> terrible. Do you honestly believe that? 
No, guys, I mean, it would change the whole makeup of Miami Beach. I think it would be amazing. I mean, it would bring us to another level, that's for sure. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I mean, he's say... been spear he's been spearheading this for Miami Beach, not just the Fountain Blue, but it would be great for Miami, Miami Beach. I mean, yeah. it's, it's incredible. I think, that, I think that people, you know, one thing I would say, I mean, whether it happens or it doesn't happen one day, who knows, who really knows, I couldn't tell you. But really, what you look at in South Florida, we're... In Florida, it's a $100 billion a year tourist industry with tourism is the biggest economic engine of our economy in Florida. And when you look at gaming in general, it's just an amenity, at really. When you, you know, maybe 20 years ago, 30 years ago, you had Las Vegas, Atlantic City, but it's really everywhere. Obviously, the Seminoles have a huge, you know, facilities in Florida. They have, you know, they do very well. Um, you know, and of course, you have, you've had legislation, uh, referendums passed in 04 that allowed the the old the racetracks here to allow them to have slot machines and poker and you know parimutuel games. Now there's sports betting with through the Seminoles, so it, it it helps the economy. This whole stigma of you know whether of it's going to bring criminals, it's going to bring crime, and it's all you know. In my view, it's just it's it's not it's not the right message because. If you, you I know, think that's that's been know. out there because that's actually happened. Right. In other well, markets. that's what happens when you have the opposition that don't want gaming. But you know, you're not going to have Las Vegas and Miami Beach or in downtown Miami. I mean, if if there was gaming in downtown Miami or Las Vegas in the right in the right context, I mean, it would it would it, it would bring a whole other element because if you look at it's the truth, and, and and I know this to be fact, you know, if you go here in March, and I saw this years ago. Uh, you know, and it's, I was asked this question yesterday by the press out in, in, in Las Vegas. You know, years ago, even on March or in, in, the, in, the, in the wintertime here, you have all the banner planes flying up and down the street, or you have cars, with, you know, cabs you see with, you know, Wynn Las Vegas, Omnia Las Vegas, Hawkinson Las Vegas. The, the, the customers are going back and forth. You know, and if you want to gamble in South Florida right now, there's, um, you know, the Miccosukees, the Seminoles, obviously the eight tracks that have their, their legalized games. I mean, they don't have blackjack and poker. I mean, blackjack and craps and uh, roulette, which the Seminoles have. But, you know, there's plenty of access to gaming in our, on our fingertips. And, of course, now you have mobile gaming going on. So the reality is this, you know, eventually, who knows what's going to happen. But I do think it's good for the state. You know, gambling happens. And... Uh, you know, obviously, the Seminoles have done a great job of what they have. And, I, know, I would think that the biggest opponent uh, of you being able to have uh, gaming would be the Hard Rock Cafe, right? Because they just spend a fortune on their property. And if you open something up here, it would really eat into their business. No? Well, obviously, you know, they have, a, they, they have a deal with the state. The state has a compact. They, you know, they've negotiated. They pay the state a lot of money. So they, they obviously have their, their – the, the contract with the state is the contract with the state. Obviously, there's people that are contesting it. We've stayed out of it. We're not really involved in any of that. I mean, we'll see what happens. There's, there's talk of other referendums of other companies happening, you know, trying to run a statewide referendum in other parts of the states. You know, um, we'll see. But, you know, obviously, you know, right now I have my facility and, and, and Hallandale does very well, and we're happy with that. And uh, the biggest challenge that a lot of employers are having right now is staffing. And especially in hospitality, it's extremely hard to find housing in key markets for staff and being able to get staff to be, you know, motivated to come to work, to even work. How do you guys deal with that? I mean, David, obviously that's a major thing for you. I mean, for, for me, uh, knock on wood, we have some kind of longevity and they know that there's some consistency with our company. But I do hear it, a lot, and we do see it. I mean, as Miami skyrockets in rent and, and housing and all this stuff, it's, it's, it's really expensive for, for, a, for an hourly to move down here. And we do see that a lot. But we've also seen a big influx of amazing talent, culinary and operation-wise, that came from New York and, and L.A. and different cities that moved out of these big cities to come to Miami. So it's kind of a double-edged sword. Yeah, it's, it's been hard. I mean, obviously, when... The government gave out a bunch of money, and people stayed home. I mean, Americans, you know, they got a lot of checks and saved. So, especially lower end jobs and housekeeping or, you know, maintenance stuff like that, lower paying, you know, which some some in some hotels or whatever. I mean, at Found Blue, we're actually above that because we have we're union in the lower jobs, so we we're, we're priced by the union. But it's been hard to get employees back. It really has. I think. And, you know, I, it's starting to come, I think, that because, you know, the money's wearing off, 
you know, the, the, the free ride is over um, from a, you know, not free ride, I shouldn't say. I'm going to stop you there before you get yourself in trouble. Yeah. But, <laughs> uh, Dave, David, I want to I wanna ask you something. Who do you think is the next Dave Grutman <clears throat> of Miami? Wow. The next? I guess I'm having a retirement party. Um, no, guys, there's so much young talent. And, 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 you know, this next generation I see coming up, I really call, like, the side hustle generation. None of these kids coming out of school are going to go work for a company for 30 years and get the gold watch and retire. They all are entrepreneurial. They all have side things going on. I think it's inspiring. You know, a big part of my day is meeting with founders just to meet all these different, you know, VC companies coming to Miami. And it's, it blows me away how young and focused they are. Um, I think that's a really cool thing that's come and to mind. You my actually you invest you, you invest with a lot of companies, yeah. Jemima, Hot Sauce, Cash App, and some of these other places. Yeah, listen, I try to invest in stuff that we could integrate into our in, into our system at the restaurants, from daring plant based chicken to Jemima Hot Sauce, to you know all different things, and uh, it's it's worked out well for us. But who so who is the next Dave Grudman? So I think the guys that have Coyo Taco here and have Oasis, I think these are guys to watch. Um, but there's a lot of young up-and-coming group, the Jaguar, uh, lots of great hospitality companies are coming out of Miami now, and it's, it's really cool to see. Jeff, uh, any, what's your next condo project? Well, I have one we're doing in uh, Turnberry Ocean Club, which we sold uh, well. It's pretty much sold out. I mean, I, I was very, uh, you know, when we built it, we try to do everything we've done in Turnberry, where we build these club facilities. and different, a lot of amenities and, and, and really, you know, try to deliver a great project, product, I should say. Um, that project has done very well over the last year and a half. I mean, we, we had some good sales initially and then it slowed down. But when we delivered the product, people saw what they were buying, so that did well. We're going to launch another project on a site that I own in Turnberry Isle, which is in Aventura, which will be two towers. Um, that should start probably sometime in the first, second quarter of next year, I'm building a job in Jupiter Island on the ocean, which is sold out, called Sea Glass, and we're, we just bought another site right down the street, which will probably start selling sometime next year. And who's marketing the Aventura projects? Well, we do it, we do it all ourselves. It's all done through my company. All right, guys, that's uh, our time, and I wanted to thank both David and thank Jeff you. for joining us. Thank you.